wants us to get started. Uh, thank you all for, for being gracious to me and making me feel welcome. Jen has to do it because it's her job, but the rest of you do it out of, out of the goodness of your heart, and, and I appreciate the non-professionals who are, um, who are also hospitable. Let's begin, if we may, with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Uh, we thank you, our Heavenly Father, uh, for the church. We, we love the church as we love our families, and uh, as we go through life, we have easier and more difficult moments in each. And uh, your grace, nevertheless, does not leave us and stays with us through both the thick and through the thin. And uh, we are in a difficult moment now in our congregation, and we pray for your blessings on us. Uh, we thank you that your grace is situation-specific, and that you design it for us in each of our peculiar and particular needs. And so uh, give us grace, we pray, to love you and to love your church, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, I've been asked uh, to reflect a little bit this morning on uh, the current situation here at Beverly Heights, um, and I'd like to divide it, if I could, into two broader categories, spiritual challenges and uh, uh, ecclesiastical challenges, if I might. Um, and then let me say, I'm no e expert in this. I was not present for any of the uh, uh, Presbyteries meetings or for its commission meetings. Uh, I have the report that the uh, uh, Presbyteries uh, commission distributed to you and to others, and I have uh, Nate's resignation letter, right? And uh, that, that's nearly all I know, so most of you are more informed about the particulars uh, than, I, than I am, and so that's fine, I think. And so I, I'd like to chat with you a little bit about your spiritual challenge at this point first. Um, as an ordained minister myself, uh, I'm very concerned about uh, invisible realities. They do exist. One of the lovely uh, excellencies of the Nicene Creed compared to the Apostles is uh, the Apostles' Creed is very brief in its first article, believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But the uh, Nicene Creed you know, says, and the maker of all things visible and invisible, right? And expressly asserts that there is an invisible realm that is as much the creature of God as the visible realm. It doesn't look that way to us because, ironically, it's invisible, right? So the two errors one could make is to say, because the invisible realm is not visible, it doesn't exist. The other error, because the pendulum always goes to extremes, would be to say, the invisible realm exists and I can see it, right? <laughs> and you've, we've all met some people who do that. So finding the kind of... Uh, uh, Goldilocks middle in between those, or Aristotelian if you've read the Nicomachean, whichever way you do it is sort of difficult for us. And uh, I suggest at this point um, there are spiritual challenges that you face as individuals, as families, and church that could be every bit as bad and disruptive to you as what has already happened. And so uh, to introduce that particular part, um, the seven deadly sins are missing one. The seven deadly sins, you know, were called deadly not because they are the only ones that deserve death. All sins deserve death. We'll call it the list of 18 that Paul mentions in Romans 1. And he says, although they know that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they approve others who do, right? So all sin is worthy of death, and the day that you eat of it, you will die. But deadly sins was the term they used for those sins which almost inevitably led to other sins. They were deadly and killing in the sense that they tended to cause other sins. So most of us think, for instance, that Cain's great sin was murder, but it wasn't his first sin. His first sin was idolatry, offering to God a sacrifice that God had not warranted. His second was the great sin of envy because God did approve his brother's sacrifice. It eventually got around to murder, right? But it began with two others. And so... Uh, if you think of the, the seven deadly sins, so pride, envy, wrath, or anger, right? Sloth, or what we would call despair, I think it is, lust, uh, avarice, uh, greed, and gluttony, right? What's missing? There are only two sins in the Gospels that Jesus tells us will not be forgiven. One is very general and is confusing to our theologians, and that is the sin against the Holy Spirit, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And we're not exactly sure what that means. It probably means a heart's resistance to God the Holy Spirit when he tries to melt our hearts and win us 
and apparently a stout and stubborn and persisting resistance to that renders our souls in a very deadly condition. But we're still not exactly sure, but there's one other. Right after he says, two verses after he says, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, for if you do not forgive, your father will not forgive you. Right? And there's no question about what that means, right? If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven, the text says. Actually, uh, he, he puts it positive and negative. If you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so there's a double, a double danger to every wound we experience in this fallen world. And we experience many of them. One danger, obviously, is the wound itself. Right? We can become discouraged. We can doubt our faith. Uh, we can doubt that anyone loves us, right? We can, all sorts of things can injure us. But then the second is if we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts, it will kill our soul. It will kill our soul. And God will not forgive us if we do not forgive. The greatest effort that Gordon actually believes the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is not that he lives a perfect life. The greatest effort is the stupid little rascal loves to forgive those when they wrong him. I love to forgive people who wrong me. I wish they didn't. I don't like it when I'm wrong, but I love to forgive people who wrong me because God and Christ forgave me. And I think whenever we take a long gulp of gospel and we feel the weight of the divine pardon from our sin, the proper instinct is to say, oh God, if I was made in your image, let me once have the occasion to forgive as you forgive. May we forgive one another as God has forgiven us. And so that is your great challenge in the situation where you have perhaps very good reason to believe that you have been injured by someone else, that your church has been injured by someone else. Uh, you, you really need to be willing uh, to forgive. The greatest proof or test, I think, of your willingness to forgive others is not that you have a heartometer, that you can test your heart and say, well, I feel like in my heart I'm right, right? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? It's inscrutable. The best way to really test is this. Do you pray for those who despitefully abuse you? Right? Love your enemies and pray for those who abuse you. And when you pray for them, you pray for them the way you would want someone to pray for you. And we say things like, God, bless them in their physical health. Bless them in their professions and in their labors. Bless them in their leisures that they will be edifying to them. Bless them in their family life that it will be rich and fulfilling and joyous to them. Bless them above all in their relationship with you. And bless and preserve them in this life and then take them to unspeakable joy in the life to come. And when you pray for people that way, you know what? Your heart is not that far from God's. Right? And so that's why that's, the, the text tells us that and to pray for those right, who have wronged you. Because in praying for them, at least they didn't kill our soul. Right? They could bop us on the head right, and knock the sense out of us. That might have happened to me. Uh, they could bop us on the head and injure our body, but we have to let them injure our soul by not forgiving them. So the two great things that I told all of the people I married before, I only married one wife, I'm not Mormon, but I mean whose weddings I performed um, in, in premarital counseling, I said uh, the, the two great traits that help a marriage last for, in our case, 45 years, and we hope a few longer, um, is that uh, forbearing and forgiving forbearing and forgiving. They, they both appear together in Colossians 3. Put, them, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Now the RSV says forbearing one another, and if someone has a complaint, forgiving. So forgiveness is the Christian grace of recognizing that when people actually do sin against us, we have sinned also and God has pardoned us, and we offer them forgiveness. Forbearance, however, is a slightly different term, both in the original and in our English translation. And it, it's sort of like putting up with the fact that people are just messy, right? Many of the things that bother us about one another are actually not sins that can be pardoned. They're just a nuisance. My, my poor wife has been trying to keep a, a nice and clean, neat household for 45 years, and the only problem she encounters is her husband, right? <laughs> So I, I, I'm one of those people who has never remembered well. It's not just because I'll be 68 tomorrow. It's, I've always been this way. I like to have visual reminders of things. 
And so if I'm making the coffee in the morning and I use up either the last of it or almost the last, I leave it on the counter by my car keys, which means when I go out and get in the car, I take it with me, right? And that's my reminder to pick up some coffee beans before I come home that day. So as my wife very eloquently, and I'm sure uh, charitably intends it, she says, Dave leaves little messes wherever he goes, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I think I do. I've always left something here and something there to remind me of something. And the poor woman has to, go. and if she cleans up the mess, I'll say, you know, you clean up my mess. You can't do that. That's my, right? You've ruined my system, right? <laughs> so, so uh, she doesn't really have to forgive me, but she sure does have to put up with a lot, right? So forgiving is one thing when people have wronged us. Forbearing is just putting up with the fact that people are sometimes a nuisance in various ways and just hard to deal with. Um, in your circumstances, you may have to either forbear or forgive, and uh, I, I just tr entrust you to God's grace that he will give you the grace to do so. Um, and so uh, you, you, you should be praying for the people. You should be praying for the Presbytery of the Alleghenies, and especially for the four or five men who served on the commission. You should pray for them as you would for your own children, for your, your mother and your father, your brother and your sister. You should pray that God would give them rich blessings in this life and then give them unspeakable joy in the life to come. And if you do that, at least your soul will not have died. They might have taken your pastor. They will not take your soul. And if you don't do that, they may get your pastor and your soul. And don't give them that. Right? Do not give them that, uh, beloved. So uh, the real proof of your forgiveness is not that you have a heartometer. The real proof of your forgiveness is your prayers. And I've often even thought, because God is the God of all providence, and he knows our frame that we're only dust, I've often thought when people have occasionally harmed me and tried to uh, prohibit my professional advancement and other kinds of things in the past, I've tried to remind myself maybe this person needs to be prayed for. And God is kind enough to allow them to wound me in some way on the outside chance that Gordon will once do what he ought to do, and that is pray for those who abuse him. Maybe it's God's way of getting my attention. Maybe this person needs to be prayed for. We don't know. This is all the inscrutable, the invisible. This is the invisible who can't see. But it could be. And it's certainly harmless enough, it seems to me, uh, when you've been wronged, uh, to pray as heartily as you can possibly muster uh, for those that you think may have wronged you. So that's your spiritual challenge that I leave you with. Your ecclesiastical challenge, I think, is threefold. Uh, and I will mention my guests in their temporal order. And I'm not implying... Um, any order of value, right? I think that, that they're, they're the one you, you face one, it seems to be more immediately than the other. So you've got three challenges ecclesiastically, uh, and these three are related but separate. Our daughters are related but separate, and we've treated each of our three daughters a little differently from the other two. Uh, that's just what we do. They are related, but they're separate, and we deal with them uh, differently. Dabney had hurt uh, her foot or ankle last week on Monday night playing soccer. She's 33. She should stop doing this. <laughs> uh, that, uh, and uh, her husband didn't get off till later uh, on that day, and uh, my wife was up keeping the grandsons in Warren, Pennsylvania. Uh, so uh, I guess it was Tuesday after having lunch with Peter and Tom. Uh, I went down to where she was in uh, Franklin Park and took her to a, what do they call those, Med Express or something like that? Yeah, if that was Express, I'm Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> that, was, that, was that was just not Express at all. <laughs> but, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, this is what my daughter needs at this point. The other daughter had not injured her ankle, and the one who died of leukemia many, many years ago, she's in a better world and doesn't need my care now. So you, they are related to one another, but they are separate. And, and these three things are related, of course, ultimately, but they are separate. Um, and so here they are first, and I'll say a word. Uh, the congregation's relationship to the Presbytery of the Alleghenies. I, I think, uh, as we'll see, that that is a, a high priority. Um, Nate Devlin, uh, how to care for him, how to care for Holly and the children, uh, and what to think about what next in that arena. And uh, uh, also then, um, uh, what do you do with the problem of your ministerial relations when you don't have a pastor here at this point? So the whole thing of... Nate and his possible successor or whatever. And then uh, third, uh, your denominational home. Um, so I rank your relationship to the Presbyterian of the Alleghenies first because in the nature of chapter five of the Book of Church Order of the uh, EPC, um, in the manner of seeking dismissal, you have a congregational meeting 
and within either three to six months, not before three months and not after six months, you have to have a separate uh, meeting. So on the assumption that you may have had one or are in the process of planning one, you do then have a window in which you simply have to act. And so I'm not saying that's more important uh, to you than other considerations. I'm saying it presses you uh, to be able to make a decision. So I think that uh, that one um, is a matter that has a certain timeliness to it uh, that the others may not. And so uh, I, I didn't read the whole book of church order, but all Presbyterian books of church order are reasonably similar. And uh, my PCA book of church order also has a chapter on dismissal of churches. And in ours, it actually says that the relationship between congregations and the PCA is a matter of mutual love and confidence. And what I've always said is, uh, even the devil can't completely destroy mutual love. Christians love other Christians. We love them the way we love our spouses when they leave messes and so forth. We still love them, right? But confidence comes and goes, right? Love may be a grace the way justification is by grace. But confidence is by works. We have confident in people, confidence in people that have earned our confidence. We trust people who have earned our trust. And so in the PCA, uh, I've got a two friends now in churches that are considering the possibility of leaving the PCA, and I've said in each case, uh, do you have confidence in the courts of the PCA? If you have confidence in them, uh, and you're just momentarily disappointed, but you think overall they're good people, it's like the confidence you have in your physician. He could probably over-prescribe or under-prescribe something one time. You don't want to make a habit of it, but if you have confidence in your physician, you submit to his care. If you've lost confidence in your physician, you don't submit to his care anymore. And so I can't make that decision for you, but that's the decision I think that is before you. You have to make that decision whether you wish to continue a relationship with the Presbytery of the Allegheny. And then secondly, of course, uh, you, you're constantly or should be constantly wrestling with Nate and Holly and the kids and so forth. And what, if any, duties do you have to them? What, what do you do with the person who has resigned? Um, uh, how do you care for them? Who's looking out for them? Uh, and um, so you have your ministerial obligation, I think, to uh, provide for them, to care for them, to be sure that someone's <coughs> keeping an eye on them. Um, and then you have the confusing situation that I'm sure must cross some of your minds is, if we leave the uh, EPC, could we then call Nate back? And if we did, would he come? And I can't answer any of those, right? I'm entirely, that's in the invisible realm, right? I think on paper, <coughs> Nate says he's resigned. And I would take it that that means he's resigned. Um, so I'm in no position to advise or counsel him or predict what he may do next, right? Because I just don't know. Um, but I do think you certainly have affection for him that, you, that he's earned from many years as an associate pastor and then as a senior pastor. And so um, I would think it's your uh, duty to look out for them as best as you possibly can. Um, and the third thing, your denominational home, this is the least pressing of them all. I mean, there's tons of Presbyterian denominations out there. Uh, you know, Dr. Clowney was the president of Westminster Seminary in Philly when I was attending there, and he referred to us as the split peas, because <laughs> there were so many of us, right? You've got, you've got this group, and this group, and this group, and so forth. Um, and I, the, I, my guess is the reason there's so many is there's probably some Scottish blood in there somewhere, and that caused the problem. Um, <laughs> So uh, at, at any rate, uh, there are plenty of other uh, good, good denominations out there, and um, you can affiliate with them at whatever time you wish. I would say focus on the other two things earlier on and give passing attention, passive attention to the question of what other communions are out there. Visit some of them and that sort of a thing from time to time. You know, I'm in the, I happen to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church in America. Um, I'm in the Ascension Presbytery between roughly Cranberry and Erie. And then uh, our jurisdiction here would be the Pittsburgh Presbytery that covers from here to the panhandle, actually, of Maryland. Uh, of that. But, uh, but the PCA is there, the OPC is there, the RPC and A is there, and so forth. And there are other good Presbyterian and reform bodies that you can look at. But uh, it, would, it will not kill you or stunt your growth if in your overall church's history, for a two- or three-year period, you had no denomination at all. Ultimately, you do believe in a connected church because that's the church of the New Testament. When there's a problem in Antioch, they go to Jerusalem to solve it, right? And they send representatives, right? So we wish to be connected to other churches so that we may be a blessing to them and they a blessing to us. But if, under an extraordinary situation, you had to be denominationalists, right? Uh, sort of like 
Ed, uh, uh, Everett Hale's book, The Man Without a Country, <laughs> if you had to be denominationally without a country for two or three years, I don't think it would kill you. And I don't think your, your decisions on the first two matters should contingent in any way on your uh, decision about the third matter. Um, normally, uh, representatives of the various other communions geographically are very happy to meet with people as you get closer to making a decision. And sometimes we do it together. Sometimes I've been with Orthodox Presbyterian ch Church, PCA churches, and we, we together go to some places that are between churches. In New England, it was normally um, a liberal congregational den denomination that people wanted to leave, and they weren't sure where to go. And so we would go together and meet with them and say, maybe you want to find a more conservative congregational church, or maybe you're willing to switch sh uh, ships a little bit and go to somewhere else. We'd rather be uh, facilitators. We, we, we're not trying to sell cars or anything like that, because uh, so, so, ours would be a lemon. Um, we don't <laughs> want to do that. So there's plenty of those out there, so I would say you should be in no rush on that. Um, and so I, I wanted to just say, one other thing about sort of my, my view of matters in general, ecclesiastical at this point. Um, my communion, the PCA, was established in 1973, and its founders came out of the mainline Presbyterian Church. The EPC was founded only eight years later, less than a decade later, and coming out of the same body, right? And so our communions are actually very, very similar in their origins that uh, they are people who were dissatisfied with aspects of mainline Presbyterian Christianity in America, and at roughly the same time, ecclesiastically speaking, they founded the EPC distinguishing itself by having a slightly more openness to women serving in the eldership or the pastorate than the PCA had, but otherwise virtually identical. Um, and as I observe those uh, two communions, uh, mine and yours over the years, um, I've observed one thing that I'm not very happy about, and the way I put it with, uh, with Tom in conversation was, uh, you can take the man out of the main line. You cannot take the main line out of the man. And Presbyterian history, for at least the last 130 years, has witnessed this curious paradox that Presbyterian bodies that have a book of church order that has three parts, the book of government, the form of government, the book of discipline, and the directory of worship, one third of our constitution is a book of discipline that can put you to sleep on a night when you can't sleep with all of its procedures and these kinds of things in it, right? And yet on most of the critical decisions our Presbyterian churches have made since they defrocked J. Gresham Machen in 1929, most of the bad decisions we've made are where we bypassed our book of order altogether. We just threw the book of discipline out the window and we just acted as though it didn't exist. And so in Machen's case, at his trial, and it, it, he was accused of supporting a mission work that was not a mission work of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. And the constitution of the church at that point said that both, minister, both lay people and clergy may, in addition to supporting the Presbyterian Church, support other Christian organizations. And so it was a slam dunk. The, the, the constitution plainly authorized him to do what he did. And so before the trial began, the moderator of the trial said, uh, to Mr. Machen and his representatives, we will not entertain constitutional arguments at this hearing. And so Machen conferred with his representative for about a minute and a half and they left the room. We've got this big book that tells us how we're gonna function and you're not gonna pay any attention to your own law, right? Well then, how can I pay attention to it and what would be the point, right? And so in almost all of the really bad decisions they are not due to the people who make them being bad people. They are due to the fact that they do not have a sufficient regard for procedural justice. All people like justice at the end of the day. We like to see the right thing done, right? We all do. But then some people historically have also said, the likelihood of your getting there without procedural justice is very slender. So uh, Madison's primary contribution was not in the Federalist Papers. James Madison was primarily responsible as the author of the uh, Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And of those 10 amendments, five of them are technical matters of judicial process, right? You have the right to have an indictment in writing to know what you're dealing with. You have a right to a speedy trial. You have a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. You have the right not to incriminate yourself, right? 
It goes on with these kinds of things because in the very act of their giving authority, this new thing that we call the United States of America, they wanted to make sure that its power was not used unjustly. And so they hamstrung it, right, by guaranteeing certain rights. And so people who get that realize you will rarely get actual justice if you do not have procedural justice. I think I omitted right to confront your accuser, but that's in there too, right? Why should someone be able to accuse Gordon of dunking basketballs unmercifully, right, if I don't even know who said it, right, or have a chance to say, when did you see me dunking basketballs, right? And, and, and to confront. So these things are just woven into basic justice. You can find them in Plato's Republic. You can find it in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. You find it in the founding documents of our uh, uh, republic. You find it in our books of church order. But the worst decisions the PCA has ever made, the PCOS has ever made, and the EPC has ever made is when they throw the whole book out of the window, as it were, functionally, and simply decide we four or five people in this room all possessed of the, will of the wisdom of Solomon, we do not need to follow any process because we're just too smart to need that. So these people never appear arrogant in the way they carry themselves. They're very nice people. They just don't get it in their heads that procedural justice is essential to justice itself. And so what happens then is people who think they will be tried by a proper procedure find that, in fact, they are tried, they're found guilty, and no process at all was followed which also means that they can't appeal because there's no record of a case to send up to General Assembly from Presbytery, no list of the accusers and what they said, no list of the uh, witnesses and what they said. There is no case to be sent up for review by the higher court because there was no proper process followed. And so it appears that that's what happened in this case. As I read the report that you received from the uh, commission of the Presbytery, uh, it made reference uh, uh, to fellow presbyters and guests, I take it to mean that that's public, that they did not make a, a private interview with Nate and others, and then speak with him privately and say, brother, we think you'd be a better pastor if you wore a bow tie. And he said, well, I'll think about it, but I don't know, right? There's limits. Um, so uh, fellow presbyters and guests means that this could border on what lawyers would call defamation of character because it's a public statement. And so it would have never been wrong to say, I think you'd be a better professor. In my, or in my case, they say you'd be a better preacher if you stood on a box, right? That would, that would help a great deal. Fine. But that's the kind of thing you say in public, right? And then on the same page, it, it, it quotes the book of church order, admonition is the formal reproof of an offender by a church court, warning of his guilt and danger, and encouraging him to be more careful and watchful in the future. And then it refers to the sanction of admonition also. So they've administered the sanction of admonition, which is the first of the lowest, it's the lowest sanction in our book of church order. You go from sanction to uh, definite suspension to indefinite suspension uh, to excommunication and or in the case of minister, demission of office. And so uh, he has been formally admonished as though he were guilty of something he did and was tried for, and yet he was not tried for, right? And so that strikes me as a remarkable injustice, but the PCA does it from time to time ourselves, right? We, you can take the man out of the main line. You cannot take the main line out of the man. Those who have acted for over a century as though we did not have a book of discipline continue to act as though we didn't have a book of discipline. And worse, uh, often it's done on the, the sl most slender and subjective of motivations. Uh, we want to be relational. We want to be pastoral. We want to address this pastorally, which means we will not be bound by anything we do by our constitution, right? And so uh, that's the nature of Presbyterian history for the last 100 years or so. It happens again and again and again that procedural justice is skirted by people who think they don't need it, that they do need it. I need it and you need it. And interestingly, the law of justice and the law of charity in my mind are virtually identical. To do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Before you were tried, would you like to have an indictment so you know what you're being tried for? Would you like to have the right to confront your accuser? Would you like to be free from self-incrimination? So when people ask you a pastoral question and you candidly tell them that, that becomes a, an incriminating act, right? All of the things that are procedural justice are just Jesus' law of charity, do unto others as you would have it done unto you. We would want a speedy trial. 
We want the right to confront our accusers. We want the, the chance to cross-examine and so forth. All of the things that were so obvious to Mr. Madison are, are matters of charity. They are not merely matters of justice. And in that sense, an unintentional, uncharitable act has happened, right? Unintentional, uncharitable. Uncharitable because it's not just, and we should treat one another with justice. But I'm sure it was unintentional. No one set out to do an unjust thing. So I think that's where the circumstance is at this point. And uh, as I say, I have friends in my own communion now who, who are considering dismissal from the Presbyterian Church in America for very similar reasons, for situations in which the effect of a proper disciplinary action has taken place without the disciplinary action. And so uh, that the, the Presbyterian tendency to fly by the seat of our pants rather than by the seat of our book of discipline is unfortunately at least a century old now. And it's underneath and around many of the church divisions uh, that we've witnessed. And unfortunately, it appears from what I've seen, just the two documents I have, that that's what happened in this case. Um, and so uh, that's where you are. And so I think there is some relationship between uh, your spiritual challenge and your ecclesiastical challenge, because I think the second creates the need for the first. Uh, you may very well and understandably feel wounded and wronged uh, by the action of the commission of the Presbyterian of the Alleghenies. And, and so that ecclesiastical action could tempt you to be unforgiving. And, and if it does, uh, it will do far more damage than that commission has done. Uh, the invisible reality is the devil wants you to be as vindictive as he is. He does not want you to be a forgiving follower of Christ. He hates it when Christians forgive. And so he wants to rob you of the joy of forgiving just as you've been forgiven. Right? And that's how we should pray for that commission and for that presbytery that, we got, that God would free, uh, forgive them as freely and as fully as he forgives us. That should be our attitude towards them uh, because otherwise uh, the damage done to our souls will be as, as damaging as the damage done to our local church. And so uh, we don't want to give the devil a double victory. Uh, let's limit it as much as we can. I won't say much more. That's enough, I think, for my prepared remarks. I might can answer one or two questions, but uh, I'll be ostensibly preaching today if, if I survive my pathway through the hall and no one attacks me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so uh, I can't stay as long as I might wish, but if you have questions where my expertise might help, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, I think so. I've said for years, I think it, it's sort of like a rookie error, right? So uh, in our communion, our, our book of church order sort of logically built. I think yours is too. But when you actually have process, you need to follow the temporal order. Certain things have to be done first. And you might read two pages later, than th this, this, this has to follow an order that was given 30 days earlier or something like that, right? So one of my uh, students at Gordon Conwell and I put together a procedural thing for the PCA once where we put it in the temporal order you needed to do them. Uh, and I think that our stated clerk in Atlanta still distributes that to people when they call him and ask for some help. So yes, a lot of it's just rookie error, right, that, that people don't do it. And, and some of it is the error of, as I said, we live in a culture that, that just doesn't value due process. It just, you know, if, if you were French and if in 1789 your great grandfather or great 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 grandfather had been one of 17,000 people who were guillotined without a trial. 17,000 people. That's 10 times the number of people killed in the Spanish Inquisition of the church. 10 times by the secular French. If you had worked in Versailles at the palace, they put you to death. Now, what job did a lot of people in the palace have? We were there a couple of years ago. If you've been there, it is an enormously large building. And they didn't have indoor plumbing as we know it. They had chamber pots and chambermaids. If you had been a chambermaid or a chamber servant, spent your day emptying buckets in Versailles for a number of years, they put you to death because you were associated with the rain. Right? So human capacity for lack of process is just voracious, it seems like. And so wise people historically have said, we really do need process because it restrains our otherwise barbaric behavior. And so 
I mean, here we are benefiting from our re first republic. 250 years later, we're still in our first republic. The French, as of 1958, are on their fifth, on their fifth. So their founders did not do as good a job as our founders did, and they've had to err their way through five separate republics, even though they were founded at the same time we were, within nine or ten years or so. Um, so gi giving attention to these matters uh, is very, very significant. Uh, I've actually recommended in private conversation uh, that I might write a, a reference to the Bills and Overtures Committee that we simply uh, remove the Book of Discipline altogether and stop practicing discipline because I just don't think we can do it. Now, I only say that one of my days when I'm really discouraged or on days when I'm awake. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the rest of the time, I'm more optimistic. But there are so many cases where the simplest matters of procedural justice are not done correctly that I wonder now if we just haven't reached the point where we just have to stop doing it all together. So the problem is we think that uh, a true church, its two major marks are right administration of word and sacrament, but right administration of sacrament implies right administration of discipline. You can't excommune a person that you didn't commune. And so you can't really throw out one of the three marks of the church, not safely. But, uh, it, and in fact, I once said, <laughs> twice I've said, this is the first time publicly, I've said with friends, if, I, if a charge were brought against me in Ascension Presbytery, my presbytery, I would move a procedural motion. Mr. Moderator, if you'd like to save time, reach into your trouser pocket. If you have a coin, flip it. <laughs> Heads, I'm not guilty. Tails, I am. It will save a lot of time. And your coin has as much justice as the courts of the Presbyterian Church in America. Now, that's pretty cynical, and I don't always feel that way about my own communion. But I have said it before, and I think at times when I said it, I actually meant it. Um, and so, yes, much of it's juice. Just do this simple lack of experience um, in recognizing that we would all be, want to be treated by some fair process if people had complaints about us. Uh, but now we live in cancel culture where if anyone gets a fair trial, it'll be surprising. Right? Cancel cu uh, culture skips all the middle meanings, just goes straight to the executioner. They go straight to the guillotine and say, <laughs> off with his head. Um, so it's a tough moment to be in. Very tough moment. Sure. Yeah, if if you uh, if you were to do a fine tooth comb, you might find that there are one or two provisions in the PCA Constitution that differ from the EPC. But if you just looked up Presbyterian Church in America, um, yeah, our headquarters in Atlanta, and you contact uh, Dr. Chapel is currently our stated clerk. Uh, if you just contact the stated clerk's office and say, I understand you have a procedure for. Uh, conducting uh, judicial activity. Might have been authored by Dr. Gordon, one of his students. Uh, two people I know of have received it from him recently, so I think they still have it and distribute it. That's why it'd be available. Well, you know, uh, the, uh, your ecclesiastical situation right now is up in the air, right? It's in the air a little bit, but it's up in the air and it's not out of God's invisible hands, right? There, there is this pledge that uh, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you that God makes to his people. And that pledge is as true today as it's ever been. And uh, he will be with you uh, through your little journey at this moment to your ecclesiastical future. Um, and in between, if you're at all sensitive to it, you will notice the overtures of his Holy Spirit saying, you need to forgive one another as God has forgiven you. Uh, and if God gives you that grace uh, to forgive others, at least no lasting damage will have been done to you. So uh, be sure to solicit God's help with that. If I may, I'll close in prayer, and then we'll uh, prepare for worship. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that uh, when we are wounded, hurt, offended, wronged uh, by others, uh, that uh, our wrongs compare not at all to the wrongs your Son, our Savior, experienced. Uh, he was wronged by friends, by enemies, by uh, Greeks, by Romans, by Jews, um, and uh, all of it undeservedly. And so help us, we realize, to forgive the smaller wounds we receive since he was, uh, forgave the very grave and large wounds that he received. Help us, therefore, to be like him and help us to be 
uh, instruments, we pray, in your hand that we might actually administer your forgiveness to others. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. You're dismissed.